just when it looked like the Oakland A's situation was clarifying, it is once again getting more confusing. It's Wednesday, May 10th. I'm senior writer Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. We have had more potentially scandalous activity around betting in the world of college sports. Joining us now to break this down is our reporter, Amanda Christovich. We already touched on the Alabama betting scandal, which is a legit scandal. We've also had some recent activity in Iowa. Tell us what's going on here. Yeah, so on Monday, um, the both University of Iowa and Iowa State both released statements saying that They had uh, people in their university community, including current athletes, who had been under investigation by Iowa State Gambling Commission um, for, quote unquote, potential criminal activity related to sports wagering. Now, that sounds very ominous, but it appears that unlike what happened with Alabama, this is more about like athletes who may be underage and were, you know, participating in like any type of sports wagering, which could be literally gambling, but it could also just be like a March Madness bracket where there's a money pool. Um, So currently there are about 41 athletes across the two schools that we're aware of um, that have been named in this investigation. And there's one University of Iowa athletic department employee. Um, The rest, uh, according to at least at the University of Iowa, are people who are either like not involved with the athletic department, they're quote unquote student, staff members, former athletes, that sort of thing. As far as I'm aware, no one is saying that these athletes placed bets on themselves, on their teams, you know, something where, or against themselves, where they could be manipulating what goes on on the field, on the court. Is there at least the potential that that could be happening? Yeah, I mean, there's always potential, particularly when athletes at an elite level are um, engaging in sports betting. This is, you know, the other part of this is the NCAA does not allow um, athletes or anyone involved in an athletic department to gamble on any sport that is sponsored by the NCAA. So it's not like you can, if, if you're a college athlete, you can bet on the NFL. It's like the NCAA sponsors football, so you can't bet on amateur, college, pro, whatever. So there's, because there's always a risk that like, if you're a player, you know, you have a former teammate who plays in the NFL and you heard he got hurt. And do you see what I'm saying? But um, there's an Action Network report that basically said that there was no, they could not find any evidence that any of the games themselves or the outcomes had been compromised. Um, And um, front office sports sources, um, my colleague AJ and I, like, we are also hearing a similar thing that this sounds to be more about just the act of sports betting rather than betting on things that would impact games. So obviously the the betting industry is blowing up. They're targeting every single sport they can target. Um, But yeah, once you get into the college athlete world, things get very restrictive. What does this all mean for the future relationship between college sports and the gambling industry? So yeah, I mean, the gambling industry got pretty deep into college sports since the legalization of sports betting um, from, you know, UNLV had a historic uh, sports gambling operator partnership, like the athletic department had a sponsorship deal. And then uh, Colorado, University of Denver, LSU. And then shortly before this news broke about Alabama and then the two schools in Iowa, the American Gaming Association actually came out and said, we have decided that um, athletes can't engage in NIL deals with sports betting operators and schools can no longer partner with them. So all of those deals are like essentially going to be going away. Um, And there are, you know, there, there are a lot of partnerships with like responsible gambling um, companies like U S integrity, which is the company that uh, flagged the Alabama issue. But it, you know, I mean, even without these scandals, the the money that was flowing into college sports from the gambling industry was going to be cut off anyway. 
So now the question becomes, are, is there going to be um, a, a way to monitor just sports wagering in general among the college sports population? Um, because like the business deals are going away. Yeah. I mean, it's one of these things where it's like it's exploding, but they're trying to contain it. But it's like and that's their future clientele, too, or these these athletes who, um, you know, they're interested in sports. They're they're young. They're you know, they're going to be making money soon. So, yeah, fascinating stuff. Amanda, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Up next, I spoke to David Sampson the former Marlins president and host of Nothing Personal with David Sampson. We discussed the latest in the saga of the Oakland A's and what could explain the actions of their senior management. We'll have that conversation right after this. Here's what's trending now. You can defer payments of a full NetSuite implementation for six months. 33,000 companies have already upgraded to NetSuite, gaining visibility and control over their financials, inventory, HR, e-commerce, and more. Everything they need to reduce manual processes, boost efficiency, build forecasts, and increase productivity. Whether your business generates millions or hundreds of millions of dollars, take advantage of this special financing offer of no payments or interest for six months at netsuite.com slash frontoffice. That's netsuite.com slash frontoffice. Joining me now is the host of Nothing Personal, David Sampson. David Sampson. Welcome, David Sampson. Thank you. How are you? Doing great. So we got a new wrinkle in the never-ending saga of the Oakland days, uh, which is that according to the Nevada Independent, they are still in touch with a, at least two other sites in Las Vegas at least as a plan B, if things don't work out with plan A, which is a 49 acre site that they're you know, trying to get public funding to, to build a site, to build a stadium on. Uh, how did this latest wrinkle strike you? As exactly tracking to how stadium deals happen. There's always plan A, B, C, D, E, and F, and maybe with the A's, they're up to plan Z. But the wrinkle that no one is discussing is I'm not willing to dismiss the probability that there will be further discussions with Oakland. We may have discussed this the last time I did a show with you, which is the announcement that was made on the 49 acre parcel was not a moving announcement at all. It wasn't even close to that. And I think that people keep getting surprised when things like this come up, but we discussed the reality of the legislative session which had only 60 days left and there's no bills. You have to do a bill. Then you have to figure out committees. Then you have to figure out sponsors. Then you have to go sell it. You have to lobby. You have to get the votes because you need public financing. This is not John Fisher saying, I'm going to be in Oakland or I'm going to be in Vegas. This is John Fisher saying, I've got to be somewhere. So I'm going to use my time and efforts both in Vegas and in Oakland. And right now, this is happening exactly as you would think it would when a deadline is coming. And the deadline is that they've got to be somewhere here in the next three years. Right. And they have to strike a deal by January. Otherwise, they lose their revenue sharing. And that's the only deadline that we should all be focusing on. All of the other things we read up until January are all negotiating strategies. They're all misdirections. They're all PR based. January is the date where they have to either convince baseball that they've got a deal done, or here's a little thing that no one's mentioned. They could ask for an extension that could be granted by the union and by the league to extend that deadline if they're close, but not there yet, because what it is to keep getting their revenue sharing, it's sort of, we're not exactly sure. Do they have to have signed deals? Does there have to be a shovel in the ground? We don't exactly know what the criteria is, but there could be an extension. Speaking of MLB, Rob Manfred has been 100% behind John Fisher, at least publicly. Um, and, you know, whenever things go wrong, he says it's Oakland's fault, it's whoever's fault, it's not the team's fault. Is there anything you could see that would flip the switch to Manfred, I don't know, pushing John Fisher to sell or somehow kind of turning on him? Uh, misogyny and racism. All right. <laughs> and, and, I, and, I, and I'm not saying that flippantly. 
I'm yeah. saying that the commissioner's job is to back up his owners. The commissioner's job is to make sure that all 30 teams are settled at once, like for one minute in time. Because the funny part is, once the Oakland and Tampa situations are taken care of, we're on to the next stadium issue. You know there's issues going on in Arizona right now. Actual stadium issues about whether they're going to refurbish Chase or they're going to, is it still called Chase Field? I think it is. I can't keep track. Or are they going to get a brand new building? So the cycle continues. There's always teams that need new facilities. This is totally normal. And it's the commissioner's job to make sure that he has the back of the owners. Roger Goodell makes a living having the back of his owners until it's no longer feasible to have the back of an owner. I'm talking about Daniel Snyder. And that's when you've got a change of control that takes place. But John Fisher and what he's doing Baseball is completely lockstep with John Fisher, completely lockstep with Stu Sternberg, working closely to get those situations handled. And John Fisher has done nothing to warrant Rob turning his back on him or forcing a sale. They're not even in the neighborhood of that. Little sidebar on the Diamondbacks. There was some kind of whispery reporting a little while ago that Ken Kendrick is maybe going to sell at some point. Anything you're, you're feeling on that? Yeah, that was being whispered. I want to say I left baseball in 2017. There were whispers of that for the last five years of my career there. There's always whispers. The Orioles are going to sell. The Diamondbacks are going to sell. The Nationals are going to sell. Every team at one point or another, you think about estate planning and you think about, does the owner want to do it anymore? Does he want to deal with a rebuild? Does he want to deal with the losses? What's the market for my team? What's my team worth? I don't think there's any great reason why today Ken Kendrick is more apt to sell than yesterday, but it is very common for owners to sort of take stock where they are at a particular moment. Most owners are not like Jerry Jones, where they'll say, over my dead body, will this team be sold? Most owners are more than willing to always think about what could happen today or tomorrow. Jumping back to the A's, I'm going to give you a few different factors here. You tell me Matters, doesn't matter, matters a lot, whatever. All right, so people have dug up a loan from from John Fisher using the A's and his other team, the San Jose Earthquakes, as collateral. Does that mean anything? Yes, it could be the most normal thing in the history of sports. The number of owners who have debt on their team with the team as collateral, all of Major League Baseball's credit facility, that's the national revenue that's used as collateral. That's the, it used to be called the fleet that's five banks ago, but each team has a credit line through baseball where they use the national revenue. All teams have debt where they use their local revenue as collateral. Totally normal. All right. Um, the stock of Gap, the company that is owned partly by John Fisher, has gone down about 25% since the start of the year. More than that since over the last few years, taking some of John Fisher's net worth with it. Does that matter? Mickey Arison still owns the Heat. And what does Mickey Arison also own? Carnival, okay. which has been in the absolute tank. It's gone down. His net worth has plummeted. But again, it's only on paper. So no, the Gap stock price, it's not as though either Gap or John Fisher are going bankrupt. Inflation and shipping costs. This is something that's been on my mind for a little while because, as I've brought up here, the supposed $12 billion price tag for the Oakland development you know, who knows what that number would be by today's dollars? Because that number is, I think, a couple of years old at this point. Um, does that matter at this point? It does. It changes the project cost, which changes the amount of public financing you need. And you have to know that when you're doing your pro formas for a new ballpark and you're figuring out what your local revenue is going to be, the ability to increase that local revenue through increased ticket prices or increased values of sponsorship, those trail inflation. Those trail the increased cost of delaying the build by year after year because materials go up. And now you add inflation to that and the entire project cost is getting higher and higher without the concomitant revenue increase that will be generated by the stadium. And that becomes a major negotiating point, both between John Fisher and his banks and also John Fisher and the public. So we are right about maybe just under four weeks before uh, the Nevada's legislative session ends. And they could, of course, uh, call a special session if they think they're going to get this deal done. 
Uh, what's your instinct in terms of how these next four weeks are going to play out? Uh, special sessions are really hard to get. And we tried to get special sessions in Tallahassee and we worked our, our took us off to try to get it because we missed deadlines left and right. And they're just very difficult to get. I don't see that happening. I do not see in the next four weeks a financing package coming together unless we start seeing some leaks here really soon because you're going to need to be going around and visiting the different people in the House and in the Senate locally there in Nevada to figure out the combination of state versus local money because part of this deal, not just for the 49 acres, but wherever they put the building is tremendous public infrastructure. For the 49 acre parcel, they were building like a mile and a half pedestrian bridge to get across the highway, past the in and out to where their location is going to be. And that stuff doesn't just appear out of nowhere because there's too many people in the legislature who would say, hey, this is all too fast. I need time to speak to my constituents. I need time to lick my fingers, put it in the air and see which way the wind's blowing. So if we don't start hearing some leaks about some actual financing plans here in the next 14 days, I would say that uh, there could be a problem. Yeah. And then Oakland's back in the picture. I think you say it that way and everybody's saying it that way. But you heard me tell you, I don't think Oakland ever left the picture. I understand what the mayor said. I understand how angry everybody is. But before we got the deal in Miami, the level of anger between us and the government at one point or another over the years was uh, measurable, as in silence for months and months at a time. So I find this to be standard operating procedure. David Sampson, thanks so much for joining us on the show. You're welcome. Quick update here. Shortly after David and I finished recording, the Nevada Independent came out with another update. The A's are not just looking at other sites. They have pivoted to a deal with Bally's and gaming and leisure properties on a new site. The new plan is that Bally's would demolish the Tropicana Hotel, the A's would build a new stadium, and then Bally's would build a new hotel casino across from that stadium. The A's reportedly plan to ask for $395 million in public funds to make this happen. That's it for today. Subscribe so you don't miss a beat here. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.